Almost all games can be boiled down to action and reaction. In a way, that's what the entire medium of games is all about. The player and the game are interacting in a kind of conversation. The player exerts their will and choices in the form of inputs on the controller, while the game presents them with audiovisual feedback, which prompts the player to make further choices in response to that feedback, and so on and so on, until the player either succeeds or fails at their goal. Action and reaction. The player's own will on the one hand, and the player's responses to the game on the other. When these two elements are in equilibrium, the player can get into the much coveted flow state, taking in a steady stream of information, processing it quickly in their head, and outputting the results of their calculations onto the controller, in the ultimate dance between human and machine. Disregarding things like story and visuals for a moment, in a purely ludic sense, putting a player in this flow state is surely one of the highest goals a game can aspire to, especially given that this is an attribute entirely unique to the medium of games. Sekiro, at its core, is a remarkably simple game, which makes it an excellent case study in this phenomenon. If the enemy isn't currently attacking, you press this button. If the enemy is attacking, you press this button. Offense and defense. Action and reaction. It doesn't get much clearer and simpler than this. On the occasion where Sekiro expects something from the player outside of these two responses, a big red warning sign flashes up on the screen to let you know you might need to press a different button. I want to be clear that this is not a negative criticism. Sekiro is one of my all-time favourite action games, and though its fundamentals are simple, there's a lot of variety built on top that keeps it interesting and satisfying, not to mention difficult, to the very end. And despite its underlying simplicity, Sekiro is a difficult game, but it's one that wants you to finish it. It's quite generous with mistakes, especially as you get closer to the end and have 10 healing charges, so you can see the credits roll without attaining anything even close to perfection or mastery. And this is fine, because in Sekiro there's no in-game difference between beating a boss with zero hits, or doing it by the skin of your teeth. The challenge is complete either way, and the only motivation provided to the player is the opportunity to progress and see what's in the next area. For a genre that handles motivation very differently, we need look no further than the style-focused action games in the vein of Devil May Cry and Bayonetta. In these games, there is a difference between beating a boss perfectly and beating it after getting ground into paste multiple times and the difference is in the rating you get awarded at the end. A big part of these games is in replaying levels to get high scores and ratings, which clearly appeals to a big chunk of the fanbase, although as someone who isn't motivated by scores, this isn't very interesting to me personally. That's probably why I'm not a big fan of the genre, and I've never devoted the time to actually get good at them. But anyway, my point is that games like Devil May Cry attempt to give the player an incentive to aim for mastery in a way that changes what it actually means to beat the game. Unlike Sekiro, it's not just about finishing a level at all costs, it's about playing it over and over again until you're good enough to do it in a stylish way with no mistakes, proving just how much you can clown on the game with your absolute understanding of its mechanics. While the incentives of scores and ratings don't really appeal to me, I still think that encouraging perfection is a compelling idea that can make a game go a lot further for both player and developer. But is there a way for games to incentivize mastery using mechanics alone? Well, I'm glad you asked, because here is where Sifu knocks down the door and Roundhouse kicked his way into the conversation. When it comes to getting the player into a flow state, Sifu is up there with Sekiro, and might even surpass it in terms of the sheer number of actions and reactions available to the player, although I'll argue later that that's not necessarily always a good thing. Where Sifu absolutely does stand head and shoulders above Sekiro, however, is in making fights against multiple enemies not only viable, but very enjoyable, and in fact almost every encounter in the game outside of bosses is against groups. While Sekiro is borderline unplayable when you're forced to deal with two strong enemies at once, Sifu is almost entirely built around group confrontations, and enemy behaviours and player abilities have been designed with them in mind. Like Sekiro, Sifu is a difficult game that you can expect to fail at repeatedly while you build up the muscle memory and pattern recognition necessary to engage with it, but once you've climbed the curve, it's immensely satisfying to ride that flow state wave. To encourage this flow state, Sifu does keep track of score, and it goes without saying that if you want to get the highest score possible, you need to practice enough to play perfectly while avoiding mistakes. But, as I hinted at a moment ago, Thanks to Sifu's unique aging feature, it also comes with a genuine mechanical incentive to replay levels over and over until you can beat them with no deaths, which motivated me to actually get good enough to do it in a way that most games don't. And I'll explain all of that and more on the other side of this spoiler warning. <laughs> 
There isn't a lot in terms of story to spoil, but part of the joy of this kind of game is in moving forward into the unknown and discovering what challenge comes next, so I think it's worth giving you the chance to duck out. If you're a fan of Sekiro, and you enjoy the struggle of learning how to beat difficult action games, then Sifu is a must-play, and you should come back after experiencing it for yourself. Sifu is a classic revenge tale. After a short prologue where Billie Eilish kills your dad and executes you at 12 years old, you're resurrected by a magical aging talisman, and given the chance to exact your vengeance. Eight years later, starting from the conveniently round number of 20, you set out to get even with the five people responsible for your father's death, each one naturally waiting behind an army of nameless goons. I'm happy to be able to say that far from being a random plot contrivance, the aging talisman is a major mechanic in Sifu, and each time you die and get resurrected, your age goes up, with the exact amount depending on how many times you've died in a row on the same challenge. Crossing into a higher age bracket will raise your damage while lowering your max health, so just like in real life, boomers do the most damage. If you die above age 70, it's game over. At first I found that this aging mechanic turns the whole game into a neat little metaphor about revenge. The protagonist's quest for vengeance quite literally cost them years of their life. Except over time it becomes apparent that it only does that if you make mistakes and keep dying. If you're really good at doing revenge, then you get to have it while staying young, which I think is kind of funny. By the time you're good enough to do this, you've probably finished the game once already, and are able to go for the true ending where you spare all the bosses. So maybe at a stretch you could say that there's still a metaphor in there somewhere about forgiveness being the better path over revenge. There's a hint of roguelike influence in Sifu, as failing a level sends you back to the beginning having lost whatever upgrades you gained or moves you purchased along the way, but this hard reset only applies to each level individually. After you beat the boss at the end of a level, you can then freely start the next one with whatever upgrades you got along the way, and crucially, at whatever age you beat the previous level, which has some interesting end results. This is the truly genius thing about the aging mechanic, because it's what provides an incentive to replay levels in order to beat them with as few deaths as possible. In most games, when you make a mistake and take damage, you're only hurting your chances of beating the current boss or area. When you make a mistake in Sifu and age up, you're hurting your chances of beating the entire game. Age is a finite resource, and only so many mistakes are allowed in a playthrough, so the result of all this is that you end up replaying the earlier levels over and over again to finish them at a lower age and give yourself a better chance at later ones. When you just barely scrape through a level at age 72, there's practically no point in starting the next one because you have no hope of getting through a new level with zero deaths. The more logical thing to do is to start that previous level again, but do it better, or at least younger this time. To ease this process, you can unlock shortcuts and faster routes through levels that can get you to the boss more quickly, and with less risk of taking damage and aging up. At first glance it would seem like these shortcuts more or less invalidate the parts of the level that are being skipped, since of course the most sensible route to the boss is the fastest one. And that would be the case if not for the inclusion of the upgrade shrines, which can offer the player some valuable, and some not so valuable, upgrades. But these shrines can be missed if the player opts to use a shortcut and skip part of the level. The shrines are a great inclusion for this reason, as they introduce a calculated trade-off for the player to make. Get to the boss quickly at the cost of missing some upgrades, or get all the upgrades but have to take on a much higher risk of making a mistake. All of this, along with my own stubbornness, led to me spending several hours grinding out a no-death run of the first level without using any shortcuts, in order to get all the upgrade shrines and put myself in the best possible position for future levels. To repeat, in most games I wouldn't have much interest in replaying levels like this, but Sifu gave me a tangible mechanical incentive to do so, and it worked. I actually did end up getting good enough to beat the first four levels at age 20 while grabbing most shrines, because I wanted to save my mistake allowance for the difficult final boss, and there were a few interesting decisions to be made along the way. If you are trying to grab all the upgrade shrines, then the museum level is perhaps the most complex in terms of choosing a path through, with multiple potential routes that take you through different groups and combinations of enemies, although there are still sections of the level without shrines that you'll never visit again after beating them once and unlocking a quicker alternative. The tower level has a couple of shortcuts where you can deliberately throw yourself from a lethal height to skip some of the level at the cost of dying and aging up, which is an interesting trade-off I would have liked to see more of throughout the game, though hardly worth it in this case just to skip a single room of enemies. I think a better risk-reward balance would have been struck here if these falls didn't kill you, but instead just left you with a tiny sliver of health. 
forcing you to start your next encounter on the back foot, but still saving you time in a way that could be considered worth it. One trade-off absent from the game that I think is a bit of missed potential is a more substantial change in moveset as your character ages up. I love that aging changes your stats, but I think this could have been taken further, maybe with certain abilities being lost or gained as you age into a higher bracket. If being older unlocked access to unique moves, there might even be an incentive to continue runs at a higher age rather than abandoning them. There's a touch of this in the game already, as some moves can only be purchased with XP under a certain age, but this is undercut once you've unlocked them permanently by buying them 5 times, after which they're available no matter how old you are. I'm not a big fan of this because it encourages grinding, and I feel that the devs missed an opportunity here. If moves purchased with XP worked like shrine upgrades and were only available on the current run, there would be an additional mechanical incentive to take the risk of fully clearing out a level before approaching the boss, in order to get as much XP as possible. The way I see it, this would give the best of both worlds. The player gets a sense that their choice of which moves to buy matters, but they also get to keep the moves they've invested in and grown accustomed to, unless they choose to start fresh with a brand new run from the top. In the current implementation where moves can be unlocked permanently after buying them 5 times, XP eventually becomes a useless resource after all the moves you care about have been unlocked. By now I've spoken a lot about the trade-offs involved in upgrades, special moves, and choosing which enemies to face, so it's about time I actually get into how combat works in Sifu. Unlike the one-button combat of Sekiro, Sifu has more in common with the Devil May Cry school, with separate buttons for light and heavy attacks, throws, combos, takedowns, special focus moves, environmental attacks, weapons with different movesets, and multiple types of dodge and block. The amount of options available to the player can feel a little overwhelming at first, although it's nowhere near as bad as staring at the move list in Bayonetta and wondering if you should just learn a language instead. Something Sifu does share with Sekiro is the fact that enemies can be defeated in two ways by draining their health bar, or by breaking their posture and performing a takedown. And I think Sifu actually one-ups Sekiro here by making these takedowns use a different button from other attacks. In Sekiro, death blows are performed with the same button as your regular attack, so using them is unavoidable even if you don't want to. This usually isn't a problem because you pretty much always do want to perform a death blow, but it can be frustrating when you're fighting multiple small enemies and you just want to hack your way through them. Sifu puts this choice into the player's hands, and takedowns only happen when the player specifically inputs for it, which is a small improvement, but a clear one in my opinion. I initially thought that these takedowns were the only way to restore health in combat after making a mistake, but it turns out that all kills do that, it's just easier to notice during takedowns because you can afford to watch the health bar while they play out. As for how the player gets enemies ready for a takedown, that sublime blend of action and reaction runs deep in Sifu. I'll start with the offensive options. The combos available from the beginning aren't much to write home about, they mostly end in a heavy attack and deal damage as you would expect. Where things begin to get interesting is with the unlockable special moves that need to be purchased with XP and eventually become permanently unlocked. As these moves are added slowly over a playthrough, it can take some time to get accustomed to them and add them to your muscle memory, and some of them will probably end up being ignored because of that, but others will become indispensable. The leg sweep, the quick push and the gap closing forward kick became mainstays of my combat repertoire, mainly for the crowd control potential that they bring to group fights. The key to these special moves is that they don't simply deal damage, they also change the states of enemies in other ways, either by knocking them down and disabling them for a time, or pushing them away from the group. This gives the player meaningful options that branch out into further options. Once you've floored an enemy, you can move in on him for free damage, or you can leave him to focus on other threats while he's down. When you push an enemy away from the group, you have a similar choice to make. You can follow after them with a series of strikes and get yourself away from the group too, or you can take the chance to focus on others. In case it isn't obvious, I find making these choices on the fly as part of an action-reaction back and forth with the game immensely satisfying. Sadly, I do have a minor problem with the input method for these special moves. They require you to push the stick forward or back before pressing the attack button, which has the unfortunate side effect of sometimes causing your character to perform the move on the enemy in front of the camera rather than the one the player is actually attacking. But control issues aside, the mechanical intention behind most of these special moves is sound, and they turn group fights into a struggle to move through and manage a crowd while continuing to deal as much damage as possible. For an example of a move I ignored completely, the ducking punch was a bit difficult to wrap my head around because it incorporates a dodge and an attack into one action, which goes against the simple programming I built up around when to avoid and when to attack, 
and it wasn't worth the effort to reprogram myself just for that one move. I'm more than willing to say that this is a problem with me and not the game though. For an example of an entire category of move that I ignored completely, and that my thoughts are a lot less generous towards, we need to look at the focus moves. These time slowing moves totally ruin the pace of a fight, and they feel like cheating to me. They give you an instant shortcut to interrupt an enemy's or a boss's combo with a disabling move that lets you get a few free hits in. And call me old fashioned, but it just feels boring and undeserved. Watch a speedrun if you want to see just how exploitable they can be. Because I was disregarding these flow destroying attacks entirely, it meant that a few of the shrine upgrade options, to say nothing of the unlockable moves themselves, were utterly useless to me. My initial goal of trying to reach the end of every stage with as many shrine upgrades as possible became pointless a few levels in, after I'd already got all the upgrades that were going to be useful to me, and after that point I started making use of more shortcuts. These focus moves are definitely not supposed to be relied upon because the final boss is immune to them, so I'm not quite sure about the rationale behind their inclusion, but in any case they can quite safely be ignored by anyone who dislikes them as much as me. Moving on, there are a couple more types of attack I haven't covered yet weapons and context-dependent environmental attacks. These situational attacks are a welcome inclusion that adds variety, but they can sometimes be a bit overpowered or present a dominant strategy that's boring to use. Kicking a stool into one enemy in a group that's all coming towards you is exciting and interesting because it only solves a part of the problem and there are still other enemies to deal with. As I said before, it presents an option that branches into other options. Kicking a stool into a lone mini-boss on the other hand is boring because it's an effortless way to knock them down without really earning it. You just press a single button and you get the free damage that comes with a knockdown. Look at this room that has four stools and a single enemy, and I hope you'll agree that this is overkill. Kicking or pushing enemies downstairs is also a high damage contextual event, but it feels less cheap than kicking stools because it takes a bit more setup and planning to execute and of course because you're putting yourself in danger of having the same thing done to you, with the same result of massive damage. Picking up makeshift weapons like pipes, bats, staffs and blades changes your basic attacks but leaves your special moves like gap closers and leg sweeps intact, which allows these weapons to add variety to the gameplay without taking away options. Thanks to their high damage, it's almost always a good idea to grab a weapon when you can, but because they only last a short while before breaking, they don't dominate the game too much. Blades in particular come with a special one-hit kill move that breaks them but can be strategically deployed to skip mini-bosses. Blades also come with another interesting trade-off, as they tend to deal more damage to health than structure, meaning enemies will go down without you getting a chance to perform a takedown. If you've invested into the upgrade that restores more health on takedowns, which I'm pretty certain most new players will, this might affect your decision making around weapons. All in all, you can see that there's a high diversity in offensive options available to the player, and where this works best, and these options are at their most meaningful, is where they branch out into further options to keep that decision-making machine in your head continuously occupied. But of course, action is only one side of that coin, and we also need to consider reaction, the responses the player can give to the enemy's moves, and the enemies themselves that prompt those responses. Starting with the regular grunts, they come in a few different flavours with different health and structure values, and they can pick up weapons just like the player can, which means there's a healthy amount of movesets with different timings to respond to. It's especially gratifying to duck under the swing of a bat and watch an enemy smack his friend in the face. Sometimes when fighting a large group of enemies, one of them will get a second wind and go Super Saiyan when you try to perform a takedown on them, turning them into an impromptu mini-boss that needs to be managed while you deal with the remaining enemies. If you know that this is coming ahead of time, you can actually prevent it from happening by beating them without using a takedown, which is a nice touch that adds some strategy to those fights. On top of these standard goons, there are big fat guys, big muscular guys, martial artists, and these quick ninja women. I don't know what to call them. These types tend to have more threatening moves like grabs and leg sweeps, as well as a larger health pool, so naturally they command more attention than your average Joe. With its 5 levels, Sifu is a relatively short game. A speedrun with no glitches is just over 20 minutes, but it nevertheless gets a lot of mileage out of this bunch of enemy types, throwing them at you in different amounts and combinations so that they never get stale, and in fact the challenge arenas added in a free expansion show off that the mechanics are capable of a lot more variety besides. Just like in Sekiro, against all enemies the player benefits greatly from adopting an aggressive stance, both because beating enemies is the only way to get health back in a fight, and because even an attack that gets blocked will still damage an enemy's structure, 
but thanks to the emphasis on group fights, the player also has the additional duty of prioritizing targets and working out which order they should deal with enemies in, a choice that needs to be made on the fly and continually re-evaluated as positioning and proximity constantly shift. It's yet another element that provides a constant stream of information that needs to be processed by your brain's decision-making machine, and it contributes greatly to the flow state you can get into while playing. The brief pause provided by the takedown animations gives you just enough time to consider and decide on your next course of action, and crucially, it also gives you a chance to adjust the camera, which usually isn't feasible in the middle of combat because it removes your thumb from the attack buttons. I've mentioned already one camera-related problem that can emerge during group fights, but there's a far worse one that sometimes rears its head during solo miniboss encounters. If you get backed up against a wall, which is very easy in a small room like this one, the camera has nowhere to go and you lose all sight of what's going on. I don't have much more to say about this, except that it's bad and it shouldn't be happening. Anyway, now that we've seen the enemies and what they're capable of, let's take a look at the player's possible responses to them. Where a game like Dark Souls generally asks the player to choose between block, dodge and parry before combat starts, in Sifu that choice is another one that can be made on the fly for every single enemy attack. And while this certainly gives the player more freedom, it also makes it quite easy to be overwhelmed with choice. You can dodge entirely out of the way, you can hold block to prevent health damage but lose some structure, you can stand your ground and avoid attacks with a flick of the left stick, or you can tap block at just the right moment for a perfect parry, dealing maximum damage to your opponent's structure. As you can see this is a hell of a lot of options, although some are clearly better than others. In my own playthrough I found that I ended up mostly standing my ground and avoiding attacks with the left stick because it allowed me to get consistent with timings and usually left me in the best position to counter when an enemy's combo was over. Strong enemies and bosses only have their guard down for a very short time after a combo, so you need to be confident in attacking immediately afterwards to get some damage in. Avoid works against all enemy attacks, but the catch is that the game distinguishes between high and low blows and requires a different stick input for them. When you dodge a combo with a mixture of both, it feels especially well earned. The clearly optimal defensive strategy, however, is to pull off a perfect parry on every attack, because this damages your opponent's posture and brings them closer to a takedown. Getting to grips with this mechanic is a must if you want to get the true ending by sparing bosses, and the timing is much tighter than with other defensive responses, but I'm not a big fan of the way it invalidates them by being the clearly dominant option. Again, you can watch a speedrun to see this in action. The only moves that can't be parried are grabs, which need to be avoided but are few and far between. A few more unparryable moves would have encouraged a bit more variety in the player's responses. With everything I've said so far, you may have noticed that my thoughts on Sifu's combat and flow state potential are more positive when it comes to group fights, which provide a lot more options and a lot more information for the player to process when compared to solo encounters. In these one-on-one -on -one confrontations, knockdowns and environmental attacks are a little too exploitable, and an obvious dominant strategy emerges of disabling and punishing, which, to put it simply, is boring, and doesn't ask the player to perform the same on-the-fly decision-making as group fights. So now you must be asking with bated breath what my feelings are around the boss fights, which cap off each level with a face-off against a single character. And the answer is… mixed. Generally speaking, boss fights are a highlight of most games for me, a climactic challenge that stops you in your tracks and demands that you've learned enough about the game to get past them. Learning my way around a boss's moveset and climbing my way up their difficulty curve is a pleasant struggle that I doubt I will ever get bored of, and there's a good reason it's a tradition that's stuck around since the earliest days of gaming. The bosses of Sifu are satisfying to learn, and thanks again to the aging mechanic you're incentivized to replay them again and again until you can beat them with no deaths. Where they're at their best is where they ask for a wide variety of responses from the player, like the second phase of the museum boss who has a lengthy up-close combo, a powerful gap-closing thrust, and a projectile attack that you can catch and throw back at her. Excluding the final boss, the one that gave me the most trouble was the first phase of this one. I found the second part much, much easier. I think this first phase is so difficult because it's the highest amount of low attacks the player has had to deal with up to this point, and I found it quite hard to react and remember to use the different input when these were coming. Since I was able to spend the first half of the game only avoiding high attacks, suddenly coming up against a boss that used so many low ones called for a serious reprogramming effort on my part. This move in particular is a real bastard to avoid, but it feels so good when you get it right. The boss after this one, in the tower level, uses a similar number of low attacks, but I found her much easier to read because her high attacks are frontal, while her low attacks are lateral sweeps, 
I had a much easier time reading this and reacting on the fly, and I'd probably say the tower boss is my favourite of the bunch. Heading into the final boss, I was expecting a twist where it was revealed that he had a talisman of his own, and that the fight would proceed with both of you ageing as you traded blows, but that doesn't happen, and it's just a standard, albeit difficult, confrontation. But anyway, it's mostly positive thoughts so far, and I mean it when I say that getting to grips with Sifu's bosses is satisfying, and the difficulty curve was pitched just right for me. Once you're at the top of that curve for any given boss, however, the same problems that are present in all the other one-on-one -on -one fights start to emerge. Namely, that heavy attacks are a clearly dominant strategy thanks to the knockdown and the free hits you can get from them. The second boss provides the starkest example of this, as his small number of moves don't feel meaningfully different from each other. A quick thrust, which I think he mostly uses as a gap closer, and two combos of three swings each, which are what you'll be seeing the most of if you stay close to him. Once you've got the timing down for avoiding or parrying these, you've pretty much cracked this boss, and your fights with him will start looking repetitive. While most bosses move around more and so offer a little more variety, this basic knockdown strategy still holds for all of them, and repeating this technique over and over again on every boss does start to get a bit old by the end of the game. In Sekiro, you're forced, or at least heavily encouraged, to make use of multiple different types of response while keeping up the pressure on a boss with constant attacks. In Sifu, you avoid, 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 knock down, punish, and repeat. Much of my time practicing bosses was spent in devising the best way to maximize damage after avoiding their attack, which of course led to me using the same move repeatedly, although the exact move I did this with evolved across my playthrough as I came to better understand the game. In a group fight, knockdowns are just one move among many and are a healthy addition to the moveset because they always branch out into further options and more decisions to be made. In the mano a mano environment of a boss fight, however, this knockdown strategy dominates, but what's worse is that it steers you into a sort of ludic dead end, where only one action is possible, and after you hold B to give them a little slap, everything resets to a starting position. If we look at flooring an enemy in Sifu as the equivalent of launching an enemy in Devil May Cry or God of War, then I think it could have benefited from some kind of analogue to juggling, or at the very least, more than one option for what to do with a downed enemy. When you've learned all the boss's moves and have fully rehearsed your responses to them, there's no longer any problem solving to do or decisions to be made. You just play out whatever programming you've devised. In group combat this isn't possible because of the huge number of variables and actors in play, so choices constantly need to be made and adapted as you go. The decision tree is much broader and has more branches. The fact that I can beat some bosses with no mistakes at all, but still take the occasional hit of damage when moving through this corridor of enemies on the first level, tells you all you need to know. I think it's also quite revealing that the game only keeps score for the level until you reach the boss fight, at which point the game's decision tree narrows so much that there's apparently no longer any point in measuring score. So to move towards wrapping things up, I think it's safe to say that Sifu is a game of two halves. Most of your playthrough will be spent in group fights, where there's a huge number of possible situations and positions you might find yourself responding to, and there's a good reason to experiment with your full moveset and make the most of your options and their different effects. Action and reaction exist in equilibrium, as you need to be constantly considering and re-evaluating your positioning, enemy priority, crowd management, avoiding attacks and dealing damage of your own. In the boss fights, on the other hand, at any given point you'll be responding to just one of a small handful of moves, and that's it, and you can go ahead and forget half the move list because your only priority is dealing as much damage as possible. Most of the attacks that are available, and useful, in group combat become totally useless against a boss, and while it's an entertaining struggle working out the optimal response to each of a boss's attacks, once you've solved that problem, there's nothing left but memorization and execution. In other words, the boss fights are all reaction and no action. I do enjoy the bosses for what they are, but it's undeniable that they're missing something that's present in the group encounters. Sifu may easily surpass Sekiro in terms of group combat, but I think it misses that high benchmark when it comes to the boss fights and single encounters. And here is where Sifu provides a fascinating lesson in motivating the player, and what it means to get them into a flow state. When fighting bosses, I drifted towards a Sekiro-like, one-button playstyle, always avoiding enemy attacks the same way, and always responding with some variation on a heavy attack. I've already argued that I did this because it was simply the most efficient way to deal damage, but I think another subconscious factor here was that playing in this way massively reduced the amount of information I had to keep track of. 
Once I'd solved the attack question, so to speak, and figured out that heavy attacks are dominant in pretty much every situation, I could exclude other options from the input-output machine in my head and vastly simplify the mental load my brain had to compute. That may be an overly clinical way to put it, but I do think that this is what's happening subconsciously in your brain when you play a game like Sifu or Sekiro. Unless a game purposefully compels the player to make full use of all of the complexity in its mechanics, they will tend towards the simplest solution that makes the most efficient use of their brain power. Now that brings us one last time back to the question of motivation. How can you compel the player to incorporate all of that mechanical complexity into their playstyle? Like Devil May Cry, Sifu rewards a higher score for switching up your moves and using a wide variety of combos, but scores alone can't motivate every player. Where Sifu cleverly cracks this problem is in making sure that there are actual, tangible consequences to which moves you deploy in a group fight, and it's not just a difference in damage values. These choices change the states of enemies in meaningful ways, and each one ripples out to affect future possibilities. Combined with the aging mechanic that encourages replaying older levels repeatedly, the combat in Sifu eases you into a flow state and has the depth to keep you there for dozens of hours. Not bad for a game that can be beaten in 20 minutes.